Welcome to the second part of this virtual geology field trip around Flamborough Head, in which we will visit sites towards the eastern end of the headland at Thornick Bay and North Landing. In the first part of the tour, we examine sections at Speeton and at Bempton, which are in cliffs higher than those visited in this part. At Speeton, we saw the Lower Cretaceous Hunstanton Formation, which underlies the Upper Cretaceous Chalk Group. The whole of the Ferriby Formation could be seen in the cliff section together with the basal beds of the overlying Welton Formation. In Bempton Cliffs, we recognise lines of tabular flints that characterise chalk of the Burnham Formation, and we experience the first of two examples of intense deformation of the chalk caused by reactivation of the fault system centred on the Hawadian Hills. Because of the difference in height of the shore at Speeton and the cliff top at Bempton, we did not see the intervening sequence of the Welton Formation. This will be addressed in this part of the tour. Both of the localities in part two have easy access to good shoreline sections. And the first, Thornick, offers two, at Great Thornick and Little Thornick Bays. When the tide is sufficiently low to safely access the wave cut platforms, we'll be able to view much of the higher parts of the Welton Formation and its boundary with the overlying Burnham Formation. On a falling tide and equipped with appropriate virtual safety clothing, we can access Little Thornick Bay via steps cut into the till deposits that fill a narrow Pelio Valley. The chalk beds are dipping into the bay and the pebble beach is quite steeply inclined, so we can find the lowest beds exposed at low tide and then work back into the bay and up the succession. Note that the chalk units are thicker here than those of the Ferriby Formation seen at Speeton in part one. The base of the cliffs and the platforms below Thornick Nab expose chalk containing several sutured marls and in some places stylolites which indicate pressure solution of the chalk. The beds also contain lines of isolated flints, many of which are burrow form. The hammer, used as a scale in this presentation, is 35 centimetres long. This lowest five metres of the sequence is topped by a wide separation plane from which dark grey marl can be retrieved. This is the highest of the Barton marls. It's succeeded by three metres of chalk with semi-tabular flints, the topmost and most striking of which is a band up to 16 centimetres thick that characteristically displays a reddish brown patina and is called the ferruginous flint. Between the ferruginous flint and the deep groove that reaches beach level at the back of the bay is another line of flints, but these show a boxwork of burrows attributable to an organism called thalassinoides. The deep groove is formed by a major marl seam and an important marker band in the Welton chalk succession. It's about six metres above the ferruginous flint and is called the Melton Ross Marl. The head of the hammer is resting on the bedding plane on the underside of the marl. Logging the chalk of Little Thornick Bay produces a 17.5 metre section of the Welton Formation, including four of the major marker bands indicated here in bold print that are used in correlating across Yorkshire and Lincolnshire. The effects of proximity to the deeper conditions of the late Cretaceous Cleveland Basin are demonstrated by comparisons of chalk thicknesses here with localities near Hull and in North Lincolnshire. As an example, the top Barton Marl and the ferruginous flint are 3.2 metres apart, whereas at Welton Wold, west of Hull, which is a stratotype for the Welton Formation, and at Melton Ross in North Lincolnshire, which are both on the East Midland Shelf, the gap is only 2.5 metres. 
a 38% difference in thickness. Before we leave this bay for its larger neighbour, there is one small feature that catches the eye. A line of grey flints above the Melton Ross Marl, the highest in the sequence exposed here, is four to six centimetres thick, but it expands to 27 centimetres close to a cleft in the cliff. There doesn't appear to be any vertical displacement of the flint band, but 35 centimetres below the expanded flints, there are vertical veins of calcite. Could we be close to a small strike slip fault? This feature, in line with the Paleo Valley and Little Thornic Bay itself, shows evidence of horizontal slick sides and may provide the answer. The cliff top between the two bays at Thornic provides a good vantage point to examine the way in which the glacial till deposits behave when undercut. Masses of till are prone to slippage along a basal rotational plane when triggered by rainfall or abnormal external pressure, and there's evidence of repeated movement in these terracets. Thornic is popular with visitors keen to explore and experience sea caves, but war betide anyone exploring or taking shelter during heavy rainfall in this cave. There's a large mass of unstable till just ready to fall. In Great Thornic Bay, there are examples of isolated nodular and tube flints and of chalk relatively rich in inoceramid bivalve shells. This is again chalk of the Welton formation and as in Little Thornic Bay, the beds are dipping at a low angle towards the land so we can move up the stratigraphic sequence by working back to the access point for the beach. The exposures in Little Thornic Bay allowed us to log 17.5 metres of the Welton Formation to just above the Melton Ross Marl. In Great Thornic Bay, we can work up through bands of marl and flints, marker bands that allow confident regional correlation. One such important marker is the Deepdale Flint, which is predominantly nodular, but in places is sufficiently dense to be classed as semi-tabular. Even higher up the beach, after noticing grooves in the cliff wall that represent the Deepdale Marls, is a section showing the first true tabular flint, the Ravendale flint. It marks the start of the Burnham chalk formation, though the boundary between the two formations is set at a bedding plane about the hammer's length, 35 centimetres, below the flint. This little log shows the full sequence of beds in total about 21 metres thick that is easily accessed and logged in Great Thornic Bay. Biostratigraphers recognise the bedding plane below the Ravendale Flint as the junction between the biozones of Terebratulina lata below and Plesiochoris plana above. So it's convenient to place the formation boundary there as well. On leaving Great Thornic Bay, look at the cliffs to the northwest. The Ravendale Flint acts as a conspicuous marker, showing that the cliff section contains the Welton Burnham Formations boundary. We should also turn our attention to the quaternary deposits of the headland. At Bempton Cliffs, as was seen in part one of the tour, the Devensian glacial till is thin and at a base level about 90 metres above sea level. Compare that with the till deposits here. Not only are they significantly thicker, but they also come down to beach level. It's possible to recognise a valley, clearly of pre-Devensian age, that was cut through the chalk and which has subsequently been filled with glacial deposits. More examples of pre-Devensian channelling will be seen later, and in parts three and four. It's only a short transfer from the bays at Thornic to North Landing, where once again we'll be able to examine the chalk sequence at and above the Welton Burnham formations boundary. Our diagrammatic representation of the stratigraphy shows a wealth of readily recognisable marker bands, including the thickest marl, the North Ormsby marl, and thickest flint band, the Ludborough flint, 
in the whole of the chalk group of the northern province. Here we're going to look at exposures in the cliffs and on, wave cut, on the wave cut platform starting at East Cheek, locality one, and then work back via localities two and three to the access point, locality four, next to the slipway. Locality 1B is an alternative site for studying the same stratigraphic section as that below East Cheek. Look back to the lifeboat station and note the base level of the Pleistocene till, which is filling another pre devensian Paleo Valley, similar to the ones at Thorny. Below East Cheek, the chalk beds dip inland and the results of differential weathering and erosion emphasise the major marker beds. The Ravendale Flint, North Ormsby Marl, which floors a line of caves, and the Ludborough Flint. A closer look at the beds in the circled area enables a detailed examination of the lowest beds of the Burnham Chalk and of the Plesiochoris Planar Zone. The Ravendale Flint is at the base of the section and is succeeded by three lines of flint, triple tabulas one, two and three. A prominent ledge with a wide separation plane represents the position of the North Ormsby Marl. And above that is the thick Ludborough Flint. From our observations at North Landing, it's possible to draw a tentative line to mark the position of the Welton Burnham formations boundary. Between localities one and two, and higher in the Burnham chalk sequence, there are well exposed three dimensional examples of variations in flint form. Flints that are believed to have formed in the confining space of former burrows are interbedded with massive tabular flints and two closely spaced marl seams, the wooden marls, can be used to mark the base of a particularly flint rich unit that has recently been named the Vale House Flints. This unit can be traced from Flamborough Head through Lincolnshire into North Norfolk where it interleaves with and transitions to the chalk rock of the southern province. It's the northern expression of the High Chironian Flint Maximum. This is a significant level in the succession when studying flint form and distribution. As well as variations in shape and frequency, large flints, variously named potstones or paramudra, begin to appear. The formation of flint is still in dispute, but the general belief is that it precipitates a few metres below the seabed as a result of the seeding of silica at a redox boundary, caused when upward migrating fluids meet oxygenated sediment and leading to the dissolution of calcium carbonate. The Valehouse flint's member is 14 metres thick at North Landing, within which there are at least 15 distinct flint courses. This is almost double the thickness of that of the type locality in Lincolnshire and is a reflection of the deeper water conditions closer to the edge of the Cleveland Basin, as mentioned when we reviewed our observations at Thornick. It also contains the first true tabular flints of the Northern Province chalk group that are carious. These represent conditions in which replacement of the chalk sediments by silica was incomplete. At locality three on the west side of the inlet, there's a conspicuous bedding plane that comes down to beach level at a cave. Examination of the bedding plane will be rewarded with samples of marl, often gritty when rubbed between the fingers, and which if washed and sieved, will leave fragments of crinoid columnals. The bedding plane marks the position of the Ulsby marl, another significant marker band in the chalk of the northern province. The features left by erosion of the Ulsby Marl at North Landing are so conspicuous that for some they question the credibility of a recent TV series. Note the small wave cut notch indicated by the arrow. 
which appears in a scene featuring a young Queen Victoria, played by Jenna Coleman, seen here. In the story, however, Victoria was supposed to be on a beach close to her residence, Osborne House, on the Isle of Wight. The highest beds exposed at North Landing include the Ulsby Oyster Bed, seen in the left-hand cliff section at locality 4 at the foot of the slipway. North Landing has the bonus of two separate oyster bed levels, about 60 centimetres apart, both containing common Pycnodonte oysters, with occasional brachiopods and echinoids. To recap, this second part of the journey around Flamborough Head allowed us to look at the top 35 metres of the Welton Chalk Formation at Little Thornick and Great Thornick, and overlapping sections at Great Thornick and North Landing expose the Welton Burnham Formation's boundary. North Landing enabled us to study higher beds of the Burnham Formation through the Valehouse Flints member, the strong feature made by the Ulsby Marl, and then the oyster beds at the base of the slipway. We also noted the lowered base level of the glacial till and the infilled Paleo Valley. To continue this field trip, visit part three, which will focus on Selex Bay and High Stacks at the easternmost point of the headland. You'll get the opportunity to examine another zone of chalk deformation, find the junction of the Burnham and Flamborough chalk formations, and see more classic examples of features associated with marine erosion. Thank you for watching.